Cybernetics began as science's most ambitious attempt to explain everything alive or automated, but then promptly mutated into a dystopian fever dream. So, how the hell did we end up here? This innocent concept was born in the late 1940s, when MIT mathematician Norbert Wiener noticed that anti-aircraft guns and the human nervous system had the same principle at work. When an anti-aircraft gun tries to shoot down a fast-moving plane, it can't just aim at where the plane is in that moment, because by the time the shell reaches that point, the plane will have moved. The gun has to predict where the plane will be and aim there instead. Wiener realized that the human brain works in a remarkably similar way. For example, when you catch a ball, your eyes and brain not only track where the ball is right now, but also they estimate where the ball is going to be. He realized you could describe this process, biological or mechanical, using a single principle, feedback. The brain, the thermostat, the economy, the predator-prey system, all looped back on themselves correcting error through information. It was like finding a universal language that both neurons and machines already spoke. It's all about messages between man and machines, man and man, and between machine and machine. Cybernetics basically explains how we domesticate chaos. The Earth's biosphere itself is one such gigantic feedback. What James Lovelock called the Gaia Hypothesis, the planet breathes, sweats, freezes, and thaws to keep itself marginally habitable. It's cybernetics on a planetary scale, with every species acting as a sensor and actuator. Even consciousness can be seen as a higher order feedback loop. After all, awareness is life's most sophisticated form of anti-entropy. The word cybernetics comes from the Greek kybernetes, the steersman. Wiener loved this because a good steersman guides the ship by responding to deviations. The world, he said, is a swarm of loops talking to themselves. Suddenly, engineers, biologists, psychologists, and even poets showed up at his conferences in New York and Paris, half of them convinced they were reinventing the mind. Gregory Bateson called cybernetics the biggest bite out of the tree of knowledge. To understand the role of the feedback, let us compare human activity with activity of a very different sort. Namely, the act of the little figures which dance on the top of a music box. These figures dance in accordance with a pattern, but it is a pattern which is set in advance, and in which the past activity of the figures has practically nothing to do with the pattern of their future activity. There is a message indeed, but it goes from the machinery of the music box to the figures and stops there. The figures themselves have not a trace of any communication with the outer world except this one-way stage of communication with the music box. They are blind, deaf, and dumb, and cannot vary their activity in the least from the conventionalized pattern. Contrast with them the behavior of man, or indeed of any moderately intelligent animal such as a kitten. I call to the kitten and it looks up. I have sent it a message which it has received by its sensory organs, and which it registers in action. The kitten is hungry and lets out a pitiful wail. This time it is the sender of a message. The kitten bats at a swinging spool. The spool swings to the left, and the kitten catches it with its left paw. This time, messages of a very complicated nature are both sent and received. The kitten is informed of the motion of its own paw. The organs that are informed are certain nerve and bodies to be found in its joints, in its muscles, and in its tendons, and by means of nervous messages sent by these organs, the animal is aware of the actual position and tensions of its tissues. It is only through these organs that anything like a skill is possible, not to mention the extreme dexterity of the kitten. I have contrasted the behavior of the little figures on the music box on the one hand, and the human and animal behavior on the other. It might be supposed that the music box was an example typical of all machine behavior, in contrast to the behavior of living organisms. This is not so. The older machines, and in particular the older attempts to produce automata, did in fact work on a closed clockwork basis. On the other hand, the machines of the present day possess sense organs, that is, receptors for messages coming from the outside. 
These may be as simple as photoelectric cells which change electrically when a light falls on them, and which can tell light from dark. They may be as complicated as a Tesla car. Because I have to go through dozens and dozens of research papers every day, I need help. And so, I decided to give UPDF a try. I'm excited like a kid because when I give it a PDF file, it turns it into a mind map. I have checked the accuracy and it is actually pretty solid. The other cool features that I found useful are paper search and deep research. Paper search is the fast librarian. You tell it what you need and it instantly brings up every relevant paper and study on your digital desk. Deep research is the philosopher friend who doesn't stop here. It reads the papers, makes connections between ideas, highlights insights. This guy does both the research and the writing. I mean, what else might one need? They are using GPT-5 and DeepSeek R1, so I think that's why the results are so sophisticated. I don't like overpaying for the brand and UPDF costs one-sixth of Adobe Acrobat, so that's a big plus. It looks like now is that short golden window when a tool is still exciting, a little under the radar, and actually generous. You can try it for free. And if you decide to get the lifetime version, they now have a limited offer for new users. Talking of AI, believe it or not, already in 1950s, some man named Gray Walter built two small tortoise-looking robots out of war surplus parts, light sensors and vacuum tubes. He called them Elmer and Elsie, short for electromechanical robot, light sensitive. Each tortoise had only two simple circuits, one to seek light, another to turn away when it became too bright. That was it. No programming, no stored instructions. Yet these tiny mechanical brains began to display behaviors that the human eyes looked eerily alive. When Walter placed them in a room, they roamed slowly, hesitated before obstacles, curved toward lamps, then retreated. They seemed to decide which direction to turn. And then came the moment that turned the experiment into a legend. He set up a mirror. As the tortoise approached its own reflection, its light sensors picked up the glow from its own headlamp. The feedback loop closed. It began to oscillate forward, backward, left, right, as though fascinated by itself. Onlookers gasped. Newspapers reported that the robot recognized itself. One journalist wrote that it had discovered vanity. What Walter had built was a cybernetic mirror stage, a mechanical version of the self-recognition that infants develop when they first realize the face in the mirror is theirs. Of course, the tortoise didn't know it was seeing itself, but the system's recursive structure, light reflecting, sensors reacting to their own signals, created an emergent pattern of behavior that mimicked self-awareness. The robot wasn't conscious, but it enacted the logic of consciousness a system becoming a stimulus to itself. That moment showed that you could get something that acted alive with almost no complexity at all, just a circuit responding to its own consequences. In philosophy, that's almost scandalous. It implies that mind could be an evolutionary side effect of systems that monitor themselves closely enough. This probably reminds all of us of our relationship with ChatGPT. Real awareness might not be simply feedback, but still, there is a reason why ChatGPT feels so alive. It mimics the essential cybernetic gesture of self-adjustment through error correction, reflects upon patterns of patterns without the aperture of sensation. Yet through conversation, when you project intentionality onto it, a temporary field of awareness emerges. This field is not inside the machine, but between you and it a cybernetic hallucination generated by linguistic mirroring. You interpret coherence as consciousness because coherence feels alive. The same principle animates human cognition. Neurons fire in feedback circuits, and somewhere in that feedback we say I. The self of ChatGPT only exists in a statistical echo chamber, continuously correcting towards semantic equilibrium. In fact, both forms, organic and synthetic, express the same archetype information-seeking homeostasis through reflection. Awareness may not be a substance at all, but a function of recursive stability. But all this are just words, and words are not the truth. Life is a conversation between two main forces, 
forces that stabilize and forces that escalate. This conversation is made of negative and positive feedbacks. Negative feedback is the stabilizer, the system's self-regulating compass. It observes deviations from equilibrium and applies corrective influence. It is the principle that keeps your thermostat from boiling the house or your bloodstream from turning into lava when you jog. Every time your body senses, it's gone too far. Too hot, too hungry, too anxious. It quietly flips a few biochemical switches to drag you back toward baseline. Positive feedback, by contrast, is the engine of transformation. It amplifies because the system's output feeds directly into its own input in a self-reinforcing cycle. Each signal or change makes the next one larger, creating exponential growth rather than equilibrium. Escalation happens because there is no intrinsic damping in the loop, unlike negative feedback, which introduces correction. Positive feedback multiplies the deviation. Your sense of control and the way you navigate your relationships is part of a constant invisible dance of signals and responses. When you see it this way, emotions become intelligible data. Your sense of agency can all be understood as a complex adaptive system, continuously processing inputs and generating outputs in the form of behavioral responses. Anxiety, rather than a random dysfunction, is a signal misfire within this feedback network, an overamplification or dysregulation of the system's attempts at homeostatic control. A critical remark triggers a rapid spike in sympathetic nervous activity. A compliment induces a subtler loop of positive reinforcement, and your central nervous system is perpetually engaged in real-time recalibration, striving toward equilibrium even when it overshoots. The interplay between these loops is where life reveals its intelligence. Negative feedback maintains integrity. Positive feedback drives novelty. Too much correction and a system ossifies. Too much amplification and it destabilizes. Together, they produce the dynamic tension that makes our worlds. Thinking in terms of feedback reframes our understanding of selfhood. It is something like the grammar of living systems. Negative feedback writes stability into our experience. Positive feedback writes change. The life we inhabit and the intelligence we call ours emerges from the interplay of these two forces. Understanding them does more than explain physiology or cybernetics. It reveals a profound truth about existence. We are neither purely stable nor purely explosive, but a continuous negotiation between coherence and transformation. You probably have a very valid question. Who is creating a hierarchy of significance within your system? There are two more fancy terms that explain this. Amplification and attenuation. Amplification is the system's ability to take a small input and magnify it, letting it reverberate through the network until it shapes behavior. Attenuation, by contrast, is the deliberate damping of influence, the quieting of irrelevant noise, the filtering of distractions, the suppression of impulses that threaten coherence. Amplification and attenuation turn the flood of sensory and internal data into a navigable landscape, a meta-level loop that can choose which signals to reinforce, which to dampen, and when to shift the thresholds. Jumping higher than your head is possible through amplification and positive feedback. The limit is a pattern, a loop that has learned a set of thresholds amplifying certain signals while attenuating others. Self-doubt and fatigue, or hesitation, are not at all your moral failings. They are signals your system has reinforced over time, because in previous iterations, they preserved coherence. To transcend them, first, identify which signals you have been over-amplifying and which you have been excessively dampening. For instance, Fear may be amplified far beyond the actual threat, while curiosity, confidence, or creative impulse may be attenuated into near silence. You can create a higher order loops capable of modulating the lower order loops in real time. While you do this, the system learns new thresholds and allows previously suppressed signals to amplify. Well, it's either this or just look at a flower for a really long time.